Hello and welcome to another Be Your Own Loud podcast. Kirk and I created this podcast very simply to meet really freaking smart people and basically reverse engineer their level of brilliance. And we're going to do that today with Dave Johnson. His name is, he's known actually as Dabs. He's the video guy, chief creative officer and partnership officer or chief creative and partnership officer. It's funny, everybody. We were just kind of joking about the fact that he doesn't really like the titles. And I was like, well, we need a title. Anyway, we're going to refer to him as Dab, the video guy, but he works for a company. He's a partner in Tag Creative, which we're going to dive into just a little bit more deeply. You ready to do some reverse engineering? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't know about brilliance, but I'll do my best. Be your own loud. Here's the fun part is our audience is the judge of that, man. You and I don't even have to know how brilliant this is. You're the video guy, right? And and you have established yourself as the video guy. How did that happen? Walk us through how you became this video guy. That's, that's a great question. Uh, I'll start off right at the start and I'll try to work my way up to where I am right now. Basically, at a young age, I uh, love to do photography. I had that eye, right? But I was also a storyteller. And as you know, with photography, if you take a photo, it can tell a story, but it's still a little bit limited. After a few years of traveling, I didn't go straight into post-secondary. If there's anyone young enough listening to this and they're looking at post-secondary and they're not sure what they want to do, hold off, go travel, figure out who you are first, and then go take what you want to do and find that passion. Eventually, when I went into post-secondary, I went in for basically journalism. It w- they were just transitioning the program into something that was more digital. And I don't think the teachers really understood what that was either at that point. And I came in and I was just kind of gung-ho about this new internet video craze and the ability to tell my stories in this unique way and edit it and add music and, and motion. So I just kind of ran with it. I created a, a company for a class, an entrepreneur class in school. And when I left, a lot of people say they became an entrepreneur or business owner by accident. I, I don't like to say by accident. I say by necessity. I didn't have a choice for what I wanted to do and how fast I wanted to grow. It was going to take me three times as long to be even able to hold a camera for a big enough company. I had to go make the opportunity for myself. And I, I realized that pretty quick. And I was lucky enough to get a really good internship uh, right after after school with a, a guy who I grew up with in my hometown named Caleb Clark. And he was running a social agency. I kind of just fit in. He let me experiment with video. One of the first jobs I had was still today, one of the biggest jobs I've ever had. I went down to LA to shoot a campaign with Jimmy Kimmel for him <laughs> drinking a Caesar on Canada Day. And for any Americans out there, a Caesar is like a Bloody Mary, but it has Clamato juice in it. It's just a Canadian tradition. We drink it in the morning to, to get over your hangover, a little bit of the hair of the dog. So went down to LA and when I got this opportunity, I was like, are you, are you, are you sure? Like this, I have a $200 camera and a drone <laughs> And they're like, yeah, that's what we want. We just want someone that's like rugged and can just go and shoot and get grimy and just make it their own. I'd been watching a lot of Casey Neistat at the time. I just tried to emulate kind of a trip journey like that he would have to go do that. Long story short on that one, there's a ton more info to go into that. It was a pretty crazy ride, but I, uh, I finished the video on the plane, came back, released it on Canada Day. It was a success. I was off to the races after that few years later, still struggling, you know, to break into the scene. I, I don't have a business degree. I was learning from doing. Doing was what I was doing. I was doing a lot of it. I was shooting video for everyone and anything. They gave me a case of beer, I'd do it. If they gave me 20 bucks, I'd do it. It was just, let me hold this camera and shoot and edit and put it out on the internet. And I was doing a lot of stuff for myself. You know, I, I was getting on and telling people what I was doing and how I was feeling. And a lot of my videos are really deep and personal. I treat it a little bit like my diary. Mm -hmm. Share it with people. If one person could relate, amazing. But it just turned into this thing where a lot more people could relate than just one, and especially in in my hometown. So people would watch that. Oh, I need a video. Bring him in. And I did that for a few years. Eventually, I joined this community called Communo, which is an online platform that connects basically businesses and uh, solopreneurs so they can give and get work. That's baseline. And I got in there really early, sent out a huge mass email letter. It was kind of my last ditch effort to make it in the, in the video game. A guy got back to me by the name of Ryan Gill. If you're familiar, you're familiar with Ryan? I am. Yeah. I yeah, read his book. So- 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ryan, I walked into the office. I didn't really know who he was at the time. I walked in, sat down. I showed him a couple of my videos and he just turned to me and said, hey, do you want to come to the gathering, my festival and shoot behind the scenes? I said, yes. And I made him pay for my hotel room. I said, I'll do it for free, but you have to pay for my hotel room, which I'm glad I did because they, they even pushed back on that. I got there and I like to say like, opportunity if you're looking for that if you're like holding out like i just need an opportunity i just need an opportunity i like to tell people like opportunities won't arise until you're ready for it a lot like you don't you can't even recognize the opportunity until you're at that moment of like i can do this and that's what happened like all my free videos my my videos for cases of beer all added up i turned around four vlogs in four days at this festival by the end of the first day, Ryan was like, dude, you're killing it. Let's talk about a contract. And then by the end of the festival, you know, I was hanging out with these crazy business people that I, I didn't even really understand what I was getting into. Yeah. And everyone started calling me dabs and I was part of the team and I just felt so special. And I actually had worked at the location before that this festival was held at. So I was so comfortable in that environment already as well. So I think that really helped my confidence. Ryan was said at the end of it, I'm speaking at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas next week. Do you want to fly down and we'll talk about a contract there. Come shoot for me there. Huh. My passport was damaged. I went and got a passport really quickly. That was a stressful situation. I, was, I just remember like freaking out. Like we, I need, this is my one opportunity. Let's go. And then yeah, flew to uh, Austin, hung out with Ryan at South by Southwest. Again, just hanging out with, I shot a lot of content with them, but a lot of that was just me and him figuring out if we had a connection, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're, our plan was for me to shoot a ton of content for Ryan, hang out with them, travel with them. We have to be able to get along. He has to be able to not only want me at the party, but want me at the party with a camera. Right. Totally. So it's like, that's huge. You have to have good soft skills for that. It, it didn't really matter how good of a videographer and editor I was. It was like, does he like me? After that, you know, I shot for Ryan and built up his personal brand, Ryan Gill shares from the ground shooting and turning around videos every single day. I did something crazy, like 300 videos in a year. Oh, shit, many Christmas, dude. Oh, yeah, it was it was a lot. And, you know, I, but it was my opportunity. So I just wanted to go all out and see how far I could go. Like, I was like, I'm going to burn out. I, I, I kind of realized, and a lot of people around Ryan were like, dab, slow down. You're going to burn out. I just would ignore them. I was like, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. And, you know, I got to travel all over North America, all over the world shooting with Ryan and meeting people like Chris Neeland. And, you know, I consider Ryan and Chris Neeland my mentors. Like, how amazing is that, that I could pick up the phone and call those guys for advice? And that was just from, you know, being there, being available, not like really worrying so much about the financials. Like, I, I'm a true believer in learn in your 20s, earn in your 30s. Yeah. You know, I'm, I was all about just taking those opportunities and learning. After that two years, it kind of capped off again at the gathering. After being to two, they have these things called brand reels. They're like kind of the highlight of the whole festival. They get played at the award ceremony before these huge brands come up on stage. I got given the task to shoot those brand reels Ooh. and come up with a better solution to do those brand reels, a, a, a more efficient, and cheaper way of doing it. Okay. So I hired my business, now business partner, Troy. He came on and he was gonna be the editor, and just help me figure out this solution. And we outsourced a ton of our work to uh, people in, in, the, in that city. So we would hire a DOP, a director of photography in that city to show up with all the lights, all the gear. So I didn't sure. need to travel with much. I would just show up, Chris or Ryan would fly in for the interview like an hour before they would show up, everything's ready. We would shoot it. They would bounce. Yeah. And we got to go to the headquarters of Spotify and Under Armour and Hot Wheels and sit in those rooms and interview CMOs. These guys that like, I had no right to be in that room, mm -hmm. but I had all the right to be in that room yeah, because totally. I just, yeah. like, it was, I'd earned that opportunity to be there, but I, I did feel a little bit of imposter syndrome at the same time. Mm -hmm. We finished those videos up. They played in front of all these brand leaders. And the, I mean, the feedback we got was pretty incredible. It just felt like that was like a climax of my career with Ryan. Now I'm working full time with Troy just because of how good that project went. Now we're, uh, we're just working on this, this business thing. And we've kind of rebranded ourselves from a production company that's just like we just shoot video and edit video to a video first creative agency so it's you know we want to be involved from the ground up we don't want to just be someone that you hire a vendor and 
kick off after we want to be an extension of your team and uh and that's how we're kind of operating now and that's where i'm at i'm i'm not shooting as much video not editing as much video these days so i'm uh, outsourcing a lot of that but uh i still have my hands and everything well I, there's so much in what you just said there one of the things that i found in in my 20s and even into my 30s was i needed to test my limits right i mean i had no idea what i was capable of and and people said the same thing to me when i was a coach and a consultant dab they were like dude you know you can't have that many clients like no i you know what i haven't said uncle yet and until i say uncle i'm going to find out where my uncle line is <laughs> now mind you i found it that's a totally different story all right now video video is it right everybody's like freaking out about video everybody has to have video i don't happen to agree with that i think that everybody should have a video component to their marketing because it's wildly engaging and we're very visually stimulated creatures but I don't think that everybody should be behind the camera. If you were to say, Matt, here are here are three things that I wish just freaking everybody knew about video so that they can make a more informed decision. If they should be either in front of the camera, behind the camera, or even use video, what, what would that be? I agree with you. I don't think everyone should be in front of the camera. You know, you, you got to play to your strengths. And I don't think you should force yourself to be on camera because you're going to feel comfortable the whole time. But saying that, can you get better on camera? Yes. Yeah. No one's just naturally good on ca camera instantly. Like I consider myself pretty good on camera now because I've practiced. I turn on the camera and I speak to it all the time. So I've become very natural at it. And when you get to that level, then it's it's a no brainer. Obviously, you're going to be better on, on video. But I think like one thing that people need to start looking at at video more as is a problem solving solution. Like it doesn't need to be external content. It doesn't need to be something that sells, sells, sells. You can use it to engage your staff. You know what I mean? Like you can use it as an onboarding tool. You can use it as so many different varieties of things. So it's like, everyone just looks at these like social media videos. We need engagement. We need it to go viral. And it's just, that's not the case anymore. That's like winning the lottery, like creating a viral video is very hard these days. Everyone's bombarded by so much content that it's like, how do you win? And I think again, it goes back to just being authentic to yourself. Don't aim to create a viral video, create honest content that you're proud of that doesn't waste people's time. So the last big viral video that I, I remember hearing about, uh, because my, my kids are on TikTok and I waste hours there, is the guy drinking the ocean spray, right? Talk about authentic. He was just chilling out, man. He didn't look like it was staged. He was just like, he had that look on his face and he was just jive with, I mean, it was just, it was perfect, right? He couldn't have, you, you as a videographer could not have planned that freaking thing. <laughs> Yeah. Not at all. No, yeah. I could not have thought that. I, it's funny. I actually went as him for Halloween because I was like, so, <laughs> so, so good, dude. I, I was so oh. intrigued by it. And it was an easy costume. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's like at that moment, he was in that flow state, right? You know, right. you know, those moments when you're like walking around or you're biking and you just get that like feeling of like, man, life's good right now. Like I, you get butterflies in your stomach. He was at that moment. Yeah. And guess what? Everyone has a camera in their pocket now. In those moments when you feel that authentic and that good, pull up the camera and say something. If it's just for yourself later on to look back on and be like, I felt good in that moment, that's enough. Yeah, totally. And not everyone and not every video needs to be shared. Like use it for yourself. Like I just before this podcast, I was like, hey, how am I gonna get ready? I've shot a ton of videos for myself. So I went back to like when I just started working with Ryan and before that, and I watched them all forward and I was like, man, I've done a lot. Like yeah, and yeah. I forget about it and I go back and I, I remind myself that like Hey, I'm, I'm on the right track. Okay. You just said something that I, I just, uh, is, is like the antithesis of how we live in society, which is not every video needs to be shared. I mean, dude, that's like, that's a brilliant statement. And it's so true. Just because you have the means to create media doesn't mean that one, you should, and two, that it needs to be shared. I have a whole bunch of podcasts that I recorded for myself. Right. Uh, and, and the reason why I don't do a lot of video, even though that is like what you were saying, I actually spent three days in PR video training. Oh my God. Before I went through that training tabs, dude, I sucked. You know, I mean, and still I have a lot of issues. I move around too much and blah, blah, blah. I'm too freaking hyper for video, which is why I like podcasting because nobody can see me spazzing out behind the microphone. Okay. So not everything needs to be shared. The, the creating the viral, you know, a viral video really truly is a gift in, in, in winning the lottery. I just don't, I don't necessarily think that uh, people truly understand that. 
but using video for marketing, using video to communicate the the cult nature of your brand, right? Uh, because you've worked with some people who won, that's their whole philosophy, right? And if you look at Hot Wheels and you look at some of the other people that you were just talking about, they have a freaking cult brand already. So how do you take that cult-like status and communicate it or direct it so that you're accentuating the cult-like status and maintaining the philosophy or the, the the foundation they built. Yeah, the brand integrity, right? There you it's, go. It's, Thank you. And it's representing them in the way they want to be represented, but not catering to it where you're like trying to show them off and make them look cool. You're just trying to tell the true story of who they are. They're already cool. You're just trying to tell that story in a new way. It can be overwhelming because you want to impress and show off for them. You want more more projects from them, so you want to do your best job. But really, you just got to ask yourself, who are their true fans? Who are the people who would die for this brand already? And you're targeting them. If they, if you can speak their language, if they want to watch more of that, then they will share that, and then obviously that will spread. It's like the movies out there, the commercials out there that try to target to too many people too broad of an audience. They're always the crappiest movies. You want to make content for your true fans, the people who have your back through thick and thin. And I think if you can stay authentic in that way, that's perfect. And yes, get creative, try new things. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, who are the people who we already have, who are our, our best customers, our, our favorite fans, and you're making content for them, no one else. I feel that way about Wonder Woman 1984. Just to uh, sling a little bit of a uh, movie review here, Wonder Woman actually happens to be my favorite superhero. I grew up on Wonder Woman, the TV show. I literally was the weird kid who would run around with little paper towel things on my arms because I was, you know, those are my golden cops. And, <laughs> and I was, you know, so my favorite superhero was a woman, which everybody thought was weird at the time. Now I think it's a little bit more socially acceptable. But they tried to appeal to too many people and they tried to get way too formulaic with that, which was very upsetting to me, just because, you know, when you look at somebody who you look up to so strongly, and, and you can have that same problem with exactly what you're talking about, right? So if if uh, Gary Vanderchuk became formulaic and didn't try to piss everybody off with every one of his videos, they'd be like, who the hell is this Gary? What happened to Gary? You know, but that's, that's really, really, really cool. Uh, let's, let's talk about, and, and this might sound like a, a metaphysical question here, but how do you use video to market video to get people to hire you to shoot video? <laughs> That's a really, really good question. I, I actually just made some video content uh, a couple months ago talking about why do marketers and video creators suck at marketing and creating video for themselves? <laughs> and I think it's, and I think it is, it's, it's this funny thing where it's like you're, you get so caught up in doing it for your clients that you forget to do it for yourself. You're like, you're kind of burned out from doing that. I get it. But at the end of the day, you have to lead by example. The best sales tool is selling yourself is doing your work. If you're telling clients this is going to work for you, you better make sure it works for you first. We create some video now for Tag Creative and we're going to do a lot more but it goes back to just making personal videos for myself, right? Like people can relate to your business, sure, tag creative, but they relate to me as dabs more. So I'm making videos of me going fishing. And like, if I had a hard day and I'm just talking about like, you know, during COVID, everything feels like it's on slow-mo and, and it's tough for me to shut off and take a breath. I posted that while I was fishing and related fishing, a metaphor to life kind of thing. And it, I just, went after fishing, shot it, went, edited it, put it out like an hour later, didn't think too much of it. People really related to it, business side and personal side. If they see that from me and their business, they're going to go to my LinkedIn. They're going to see Tag Creative. Then they can go check out my work, but I would rather sell them on my personal side than my business side. It's like, it's, you know, I'd rather relate to them than try to show off. It's interesting because that that's that's the whole foundation that that kirk and i built our system off of right so it's very very hard to com, com, you know convince an expert to utilize podcasting to grow their business if you haven't successfully grown your business with podcasting so i sell podcasting that's what we do that's our that's our kind of entry point into how to accelerate people's influence and you know scale their credibility people will say oh my god does this work and, and i'll say well in four and a half years, Kirk and I have created a multi-million dollar company with over 20 employees. 
by just doing exactly what we're telling you to do, right? Which is that, again, it's like what I talked to you about, Debs, before we started, right? I, I want to know who you are. Like, great, Tag Creative. Yeah, hey, look, everybody, go to freaking Tag Creative, right? Go to the website, go to, you know, follow him on LinkedIn. Hire Debs. He's freaking awesome. That's great. But I wanted to get to know who you were because that's where when people feel a real, true, intimate connection with the, the figureheads of the company or people that they might have some interaction with, the probable the probability of them removing their skepticism and becoming a fan so that's what we do we move people from being skeptics to fans of who you are and what makes you unique and different and we do it through podcasting you do it through video what do you think about podcasting dude I, in fact i've never asked anybody this uh -huh. year old pod, but i've never had a video guy like you so let's talk about podcasting what what do you think about the movement what do you think about it as a as a as a tool for marketing help me with that I am a massive fan of podcasts. I have been for a long time. I used to listen to CBC radio, like all of their like podcasts that were originated on those, those radio shows are my favorite. Like my dad would walk around the house and clean with headphones on, just listening to podcasts on the radio way before you could access them on Spotify or on the internet. So I was indoctrinated to it at an early age and I have really bad dyslexia. I was never able to write and even reading is a struggle for me. Like I, I just mix up words really easily. I always just listened and I would just pay attention really hard and engage almost on a storytelling level. When I hear really good storytellers or really good podcasts, I can retain that knowledge so much easier than if I read it. And it's different for each person, but I love the movement of podcasts and using it as marketing. I think it's, you know, it's still untapped, which is crazy to me. It's so successful. I, I was seeing this before I even got into video. I was like, man, <laughs> podcast is the new thing. And again, I think everyone says, oh, I, I should start a podcast. I should just talk and I should just do this. And it's like, the only thing I would say is find a podcast that is, again, I go back to the video side. It's very authentic to you. Something that you don't get sick of talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I think you'll succeed. Yeah. The other level of success is it's something called pod fade and pod fade is when people, you know, start all hot and heavy and then they poop out because they don't have enough content or they don't really know how to utilize their podcast. And, and, and that's, that's really, I think what, what we try to bring to the table dabs is we coach our people through nine different podcasting tactics to help them continue that momentum because there's nothing worse than a boring podcaster because they ran out of steam, right? I mean, you're just flat out not going to listen to that person. It's going to be like you know, pulling teeth. And the other thing is you have to consistently put content out there because the, the people who are trying to turn into fans from skeptics, they want to see that you are committed to them before they make a commitment to you. Yeah. And for us, I think, I think, and we have a, I do shoot video and we shoot video here uh, at, at the company. But podcasting is fiercely portable, right? So, so like I can listen to a podcast and drive when fishing, right? When skiing, right? All of the different stuff that, in, that the you know, house. in your house, chilling out, right? Yeah. I can listen to a podcast while I'm looking at another screen. Like I know people who yeah, will watch absolutely. hockey games, they're all you freaking Canadians, right? Who, who will watch hockey games and listen to podcasts at the same time they're, they're watching a hockey game because we really need to hear the skates skating around. I mean, really. I look forward to cleaning my house because that's the time I get to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. Wow. So like I that's I trick myself. I'm like, oh man, I got I got an hour to kill. I get to put on my favorite yes. audiobook or my favorite yes. podcast. And then I just start cleaning and like two, three hours goes by and I'm I look like a hero. Yeah. But it's like really it feels like a cheat day for me. Okay. Uh, somehow I need to implement that into my life. That would make my wife just love me even more. That'd be freaking <laughs> awesome. Uh, but as we wrap up today's podcast, what are your favorite podcasts? I mean, what are you listening to? I'm a big fan of The Moth Radio oh, Hour. I, I just, yes. Oh, oh. I, I try to tell everyone about it. I'm a, I'm a storyteller at heart, and that's why I got into video. And I still go do story slams today. And, wow. uh, and it, it just it makes me think about it in a different way. It's like I have five minutes to condense this story and tell it to someone and make them laugh, make them cry, and hopefully make them about to cry, but then laugh because that's when they're like, they get like a seizure of emotion and then they really, it really sinks in and doing that really like helped me with my video and my storytelling. So anybody who's into marketing or anything like that, it's not business focused, but listen to good storytellers because that can take you so far. I'm a big fan of 30 for 30, those podcasts, the sports podcasts, even if you're not a sports fan, that's something that I would get into. I think those are the two that I'll like okay. consistently go back to. 
Yeah, The Moth for me is probably my number one podcast. I, I If I need to escape and if I need to get out of my head, I, I don't really know how else to explain that, but we all get into our head, right? We get into our own little patterns of crap and, you know, the tapes are playing in our brain and, you know, if I need to turn that off, if I need to just get away, I can seriously turn on The Moth podcast and close my eyes and these amazing storytellers just take me like freaking everywhere, dude. Like Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, we're, we're in business. We're doing work every day. We're bombarded by, Hey, am I good enough at this? Am I good at this? How can I do this? And we're talking about it all the time. Like I need an escape when I listen to stuff 90% of the times so I listen to like fantasy audiobooks because that's the way I go. You know how I fall asleep every night. I listen to Harry Potter audiobooks because yes. I know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. I put it on, it sets me in the right mood and I just fall asleep and it goes and it takes me to another place. I don't need to worry about business when I'm trying to fall asleep. Yeah. The intimacy of audio is something that has always really fascinated me. In fact, I found out why well, my undergraduate degree is actually in philosophy, applied ethics Amazing. and communication, right? Uh, which my grandfather, who was a psychology professor at our local private university here, when I told him that's what I was getting, he, he looked at me and he said, those are the two most worthless degrees you can get. A very supportive guy, by the way. And then after he passed away, I inherited all of his work, right? So his PhD is a dissertation from the University of Indiana, where he worked with B.F. Skinner and all of this sort of stuff. And his freaking undergraduate degree was in philosophy. And I totally wish I could have gotten him on that. But I bring that up because I've studied the intimacy and the power of audio my master's dissertation was on audio stimulation with uh, auditory hallucinations and schizophrenics, right? And okay. so we were trying to find a way to counter that. And really what, what schizophrenics do is they listen to loud music because it actually overstimulates the Broca area and makes it so that the, the, the auditory hallucinations will actually reduce. And from a business side and a connection side and a marketing side, when is the last time that you were invited into your ideal prospect's home in their quiet time. That's what podcasting is, right? Yeah, yeah, that's super true. Your quiet time is cleaning the house and fishing, exercising, skiing, mm -hmm. doing those things. Like, like those people, they're, they're pumping their, their influence, for lack of a better description, directly into your brain. And, and, and the, the craziest thing is the way that the ears work with the Broca area, it's like a direct connection, dude. It doesn't have to go through like getting flipped like your eyes do and all of that sort of stuff. It's about as direct as direct can get. The only thing that's more direct is your your, your schnoz, your olfactory system. Mm -hmm. I, I love, I, and thank you, thank you for, for <laughs> thank you for one saying that you like podcasts because I'm terrified. One of these days, Dabs, I'm going to ask somebody, they're like, dude, I hate, freaking hate podcasts. Uh, uh, they're the worst. <laughs> yeah, but, but I have yet to meet anybody who's experienced it. And whether it's, you know, uh, like I know a bunch of people listen to a lot of sports podcasts. I know a lot of people who are Joe Rogan fans, hardcore history fans, This American Life fans. You can find a podcast about just about anything. Find that thing like Dabs was talking about. Find those, the thing that really turns you on that you would literally sit down and listen to for hours on end. And think about that, your area of expertise. There are people who want to know everything that's in Dab's brain, right? That's it. That's that's what, why they would get up in the morning. How the hell did you do all of the things that you do? How do you get people to just connect so viscerally with with video, right? How, how do you do that? And, and distilling that, which I know you do, by the way, uh, in your videos, but, you know, distilling that in a very portable media is, is absolutely fantastic. All right. So as we wrap up today's podcast, like who the hell do you want to work with? Right? So we, we've got a, this is a newer podcast and there's going to be a lot of different kinds of people listening to this. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to thank you so much for your thought leadership. Dabs, this is freaking awesome. You're an amazing thank guest. You. Thank you so much for sharing all of that stuff. But if somebody wants to reach out to you, who should reach out to you and what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So reach out to me at dabs at tagcreative.com. It's just a two person shop. We're small by design, not by necessity. So you're dealing directly with the two guys who run the business and we find the best experts to help create whatever you need to create. And we, we, we focus on video, but uh, we do it all. The people that we work for is just people who are wanting to lean into video, mm. but also open to working with someone that they just don't consider a vendor, that they can look at us like an extension of their team. Oh. 
those are the type of clients we love to work with because then we have a better relationship. Like you said, like I like going and having beers with my clients or going to the ski hill with them. I want to become friends with them so we can have those open and hard conversations and they can tell me that it looks like crap and I'm not going to get offended. And those are the type of people we're looking for and, and people who are willing to allow us to push them creatively and they push us creatively. And it's not really in any sector or area. It's just anybody that's open for that process. Awesome. Well, Dabs Johnson, the video guy, chief creative <laughs> and partnership officer for Tag Creative. You've been a freaking Whatever awesome. that means. Yeah. I know. <laughs> we do probably want to that up just a little bit. But thank you for being a guest, dude. We really appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Thanks for having me. First off, we're going to make sure that we have Dab's email address in the show notes and also a link to their website and also a link to their YouTube channel so that you can actually see some of the stuff that they do because, you know, I have proofs in the pudding. For all of us here at Proudmouth, you know, our, our overall goal is to, to have you learn from guys just like Dab's, right? The, the people that we bring on this podcast are here for one simple reason, to share their wisdom so that you can make more informed decisions about how you can rise above the noise and be your own loud. Well, this is Matt Haller, and I'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thank you for listening to Be Your Own Loud, where we reverse engineer success to help you accelerate your influence and break free from the torment of sales. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to our podcast, share with others in your company or profession, follow us on social media. This podcast is brought to you by Proudmouth, the Influence Accelerators. Visit us at Proudmouth.com and join our Influence Accelerator Academy for free to enhance your marketing mindset and know-how.